Right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, unlocking the Bible, you are my witnesses. There's a lock on there. Yeah, I'm sure you could all see it, but that's a very old fashioned lock uh, with a key. Um, there are more, more modern locks available. And it'd be great if this works. Well, it doesn't want to play. There we are. Digital locks. Uh, where you just have to, uh, I think Daz was handling one earlier on. You just have to remember a number. Fine, as long as you can remember the number. Uh, or you don't have to remember a number with this type of lock. Fingerprint recognition, uh, like you've got on your phones and you can get on laptops. You can get locks like that as well. There's another type of lock, um, which is almost like an algorithm. It's, it's locked inside. Uh, it's like a puzzle. Um, can you see the, the answer there? Yeah. yeah? There we are. It was all there all along, unlocking the Bible. So, unlocking the Bible, you are my witnesses. What's that all about? Well, it's a quotation from the book of the prophet Isaiah. It's from Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 10, and it goes like this. I'm quoting from the ESV this afternoon. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. So God is saying there, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. Well, five questions. First of all, who's God talking to? Who is he telling you are my witnesses? Why are they his witnesses? How are they his witnesses? And how does this help us to unlock the Bible? And the fifth question, What's the implication for us? Uh, and that'll take around about 25 minutes or so, depending on how many divergence I go on to. First of all, who is God talking to? Well, the answer is very simple. It's the nation of Israel, a nation which he chose. He said, you are my people. You are my witnesses. We can also read this. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I have called you by name, God said. And in a very real sense, he had, because the original father of this people of Israel was Abraham, and his son was Isaac, and his son was Jacob. I have created, he who created you, O Jacob, he says. But Jacob's name was changed by God to Israel, meaning prince with God. So in a very real sense, God had actually called them by name, Israel. And he made great and precious promises to Abraham and to Isaac, and to Jacob, Israel. And amongst those promises was that he would look after them. But it wasn't an unconditional promise. It wasn't that everything would always be a total bed of roses. It was conditional upon them being obedient and doing what God ordered them to do. They were given a warning that if they were disobedient, then it would have consequences. In Deuteronomy 28, we can read one of these warnings. It says to start with, if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you on high above the nations of the earth. This was Moses speaking. Moses, who'd been chosen by God to lead his people Israel, and he was giving them this, this warning. If you obey, then it will be well with you. But, it goes on, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And there follow then a whole list of the curses which would come on Israel if they were rebellious and did not obey. So that's the who. Why are they his witnesses? Well, that's a very quick word to answer because God chose them for this purpose. 
He chose Abraham, that he chose Isaac, that he chose Jacob. They weren't in all cases the firstborn sons, but he chose them for his purpose. And the purpose was that they should be his witnesses so that no one can reasonably say that God doesn't exist. And that's how they are, why they are his witnesses. The much more tricky one to get our heads around is, well, how are they his witnesses? Think about a witness in a court of law. They're there to sometimes give an explanation of things, but often they're there to present evidence. So what are the evidence? What are the evidences that make Israel his witnesses? Well, let's examine the evidence of the history of Israel. It's not going to be a long history lesson, this, but it starts off really with, with slavery in Egypt. Jacob, the, the father of the, the 12 sons of Jacob, who became the 12 tribes of Israel, he went down into Egypt and there they remained for hundreds of years and eventually they were made into slaves. And this had been told to Abraham that this was going to happen where God said to him, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they, on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they should come out with great possessions. And that's exactly how it happened. Under the leadership of Moses and with the plagues that God sent on, Israel, on, on Egypt, the 10 plagues, then the Egyptians eventually drove them out with great possessions. They said, go on, get out. Yes, you can have our silver and our gold. Just get out. You're more trouble than you're worth. And that's a pictorial represent representation of them being driven out of Egypt. But the troubles didn't end there because after only a short time, Pharaoh thought, why did I do that? Why did I drive them out? So he went after them with his armies and caught up with them on the banks of the Red Sea. So they were there with the Red Sea in front of them. They couldn't pass. They didn't have ships to go over it and the armies of the Egyptians behind them. But again, God intervened on their behalf and under his servant Moses, he caused the Red Sea to part so that the Israelites could go through on dry land. And then after they passed through, when the armies of Pharaoh the Egyptian king tried to pursue after them, then the waters came back again and they were all drowned. After that, they wandered in the wilderness. It should have only been a relatively short journey to the land of promise, which was their ultimate destination, but they rebelled against God. God through Moses was leading his people towards that promised land, and they could have certainly got there in absolutely under a year, but they rejected him. They rebelled. They even made plans to go back to Egypt. Can you believe that? And they made a golden calf as a god that they could worship. And they said, we don't know what's happened to this Moses because he got up into this mountain. And they hadn't seen him for weeks. So they made plans to appoint a new leader and go back to Egypt. And in so doing, they rejected God. And God had said, if you reject me, if you rebel, there will be punishment. There will be consequences. So God pronounced the judgment on them. In Numbers 14, we can read, your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. And that's what happened. When eventually they did, at the end of 40 years, go into the promised land, there were only two that were adults when they came out of Egypt who actually went in, Joshua and Caleb. So we come to them entering the land under the leadership of Joshua, Moses having died just before they entered. And the new generation were finally allowed in. But again, they soon rebelled. So God punished them, and they said they were sorry. And then they did it again and again and again. They rebelled, God punished them, punished them. they said they were sorry, and within a few years, they were back to their rebellious ways. And they did this until it, they became so rebellious that there was no remedy. So they were exiled from the land. Originally, the northern kingdom, the northern ten tribes, which was known as Israel, 
they were taken captive by the Assyrians and carried captive into Assyria. And then a few years later, the southern kingdom of Judah, the two tribes who hadn't learned the lesson from their rebellious neighbors, they too were punished. They were exiled for a period of 70 years into the land of Babylon. They were carried away, most of them, as captives by the Babylonians. And the history books show us that if a nation is carried away to a far off land, then with only one or two generations, within only, only a few years, they lose their identity and they cease to become a separate people. So that should have been it. 70 years, roughly two generations away from their own land, living in a far off place with different customs, different language, different gods, everything so different from what they left behind, that should have been it. But it wasn't. Why? Because they are God's witnesses. They are witnesses to the fact that God exists and is in control. But first, they had to be punished. Let's open our Bibles, please, if you come with me to Jeremiah chapter 29 to start with. It's only a few references we're going to look at, but these are really important words. Genesis chapter, sorry, Jeremiah, the wrong book now. Jeremiah chapter 29, and starting at verse 17. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am sending on them sword, famine, and pestilence, and I will make them like vile figs that are so rotten they cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with sword, famine, and pestilence. I will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, a terror, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. And this wasn't just referring to the driving away of the Israelite people into Babylon. This was a much more general driving them out of the land and making them a, a curse, um, pestilence, sword and famine following them. And this indeed did happen. They were thrown out of their land. But it was also said that they would survive. Coming to the very next chapter, chapter 30 of Jeremiah, and this time, verse 11. For I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. I will make a full end of all the nations among whom I scattered you, but of you I will not make a full end. I will discipline you in just measure, and I will by no means leave you unpunished. And God had already told them not to fear annihilation in the previous verse, verse 10. Then fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save you from far away and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease, and none shall make him afraid. Because they were still God's witnesses. Even though centuries after these words of Jeremiah were written down, even though then under the Romans they were driven from their land into all parts of the Roman Empire, basically all parts of the then, then known world, even though over the centuries they were persecuted, yet they were and are still God's witnesses. And a regathering was promised. The, the very next chapter, Jeremiah 31, and again it's verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. So a regathering to their own land was promised. And not just a regathering, but also a new covenant. I knew I shouldn't have shut my Bible. Again, it's in Jeremiah 31, and this time at verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with them 
with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So a wonderful regathering, a wonderful new agreement, a new covenant with the people was promised. But the question is, has it happened? Have all these things that were prophesied happened? Has their history proved that God exists and not only exists, but is in control? Have Israel been God's witnesses? Well, it was promised that they would be punished. Have they been punished? Most certainly. It was promised that they would survive. Have they survived? Yes, most definitely. It was promised that they would be regathered. Have they been? To a large extent, yes, although there are Jews throughout the world. Have they revived and become a living being again? Or well, yes, most definitely. And where's the proof? Well, on the 15th of May, 1948, following arguably the worst persecution that God's people have ever had to endure at the hands of the, the German Nazis, this headline appeared in a paper that was then called the Palestine Post, still in existence today. It's called the Jerusalem Post. And its headline was, State of Israel is Born. And the modern state of Israel had been reborn. They had revived. And we're used to seeing that flag, aren't we? The flag of Israel. We're used to seeing it at Olympic Games and um, Winter Olympics, less so. We see it at um, World Championships of all sorts of things. We even see it at the Eurovision Song Contest, although I don't think they made the final this year. I didn't actually watch it. But we're used to that flag. We're used to the fact that Israel is a nation. It's in the papers, on the headlines, almost all of the time. We're used to it. And every time we see that flag, every time we hear the name of the state of Israel, it's proof to us that God keeps his promises and that Israel are his witnesses. So getting back to those five questions, the fourth one was, well, how does this help us to unlock the Bible? Well, I suggest it provides solid evidence, I'd actually call it proof, that God exists. And it shows that God keeps his promises. Promises made centuries ago, God keeps them. He always keeps his promises. And it shows that God has a plan, which is throughout the Bible outlined for us. It's a plan which is centered on Israel and on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And seeing Israel as God's witnesses helps us to unlock, to get our way into, to understand God's message for us in the Bible. So the fifth question, what's the implication for us? Yes, we see Israel in the papers and on our TV screens or our phones. We see it all the time. But what's the implication for us? What should it cause us to do? What do we have to do? We need to read God's word for ourselves. We need to unlock its message. It's not difficult. Yes, it's a long book. There's lots of pages to it, lots of chapters, lots of different books. But it's got one inspired message. It's God speaking to you and to me. And by reading it for ourselves, we can unlock its message and understand what God is telling us. We need to unlock the message about God himself, because he shows to us in his word and in his son, Jesus Christ, he shows to us what he is like. He shows us his characteristics, what makes him tick, if you like. We need to unlock the message about his plan, because he has got a master plan for this earth and for men and women upon it. And it's outlined to us in the Bible, and it's centered in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to find out about Jesus. Read for ourselves the things that he did, the miracles that he performed, the, the words which he spoke, the teaching which he gave to people, what he wants us to listen to. And we can unlock the message about how we can be involved in God's plan. 
because God will send his son back to this earth, we believe very soon, and God's plan will unfold in his kingdom being established on the earth. And by unlocking the Bible, we can read for ourselves how we can be involved in that wonderful kingdom. And then, after reading, we need to make a decision. Do we believe the evidence? Do we believe that Israel are witnesses to the fact that God exists and is in control? Or do we ignore the evidence? Do we say, well, yeah, that's all very well, but I'm not interested. It's totally up to you. Thank you.